After traveling two leagues, the procession, which includes Don Quixote, Sancho, and also the barber, the priest, and the officers of the Holy Brotherhood, stops to rest at another locus amenus, where they are approached by another group of travelers, which include a canon of Toledo. The canon recognizes the officers and wants to know more about the robber or delinquent in the cage. One of the officers invites him to talk to Don Quixote, and the Hidalgo asks the canon if he is versed regarding knight errantry. Given the negative reputation that chivalric novels had among humanists, here's another ironic moment, like that of the scrutiny of Don Quixote's library. Yet another educated religious man admits to having assiduously read the genre that Cervantes mocks. Amen, brother. I know more about books of chivalry than I do about Villalpando's Sumulas. Villalpando was a professor at the University of Alcala, and in his book, he advocated direct reading of the works of Aristotle. Our canon is anti-intellectual. Don Quixote explains that he is a knight errant and that he has been enchanted, although he is one of those who, in spite of and beyond the reach of envy herself and all the magicians, Brahmins, and gymnosophists born of Persia, India, and Ethiopia, will place his name in the temple of immortality so as to serve as an example and paragon for future centuries. By the way, these three types of enchanters appear in the same order in the Florida by Apuleius, the same author of The Golden Ass, the first picaresque novel from the second century AD. The priest confirms everything Don Quixote says about his enchantment, and the canon is astonished. By contrast, Sancho takes advantage of the arrival of the canon to assert his skepticism. The fact of the matter is that my master Don Quixote goes forth as enchanted as my mother. Then Sancho directly confronts the priest. Oh, Sir Priest, Sir Priest, did your worship really think I do not recognize you? And did you think I cannot discover and divine what all these new enchantments are about? Wow. Sancho is on the brink of dismissing the existence of all the enchanters, ghosts, and devils conjured by the priest to fool Don Quixote. The squire's philosophical position is like that of Hobbes, the materialist philosopher who constantly attacked the fictions maintained by the lying sacerdotal divines of the Catholic Church. The irony is that Sancho only articulates his criticism of the church because he fears the loss of the island of Micomicon that his master has promised him. Cervantes is famous perspectivism again. Sancho seems modern and scientific in his realistic and anti-hierarchical attitude. Since I am a man, I can come to be made pope, and even more so, the governor of an island. But we also glimpse his racist and tyrannical tendencies when he says, I'm an old Christian, and I demand islands. This is why the barber accuses him of having become impregnated by the promises of his master. At this point, priest and canon move away and have a long theoretical debate about the romances of chivalry. The canon's commentary composes the rest of chapter 47. This is another sophisticated reflection on the role of literature in society. It deserves our attention because it expresses the humanist objection to chivalric fiction, but also because it ends with a gigantic contradiction. The canon begins his discourse in a way that many sophisticated readers of the time would have found familiar and reasonable. He alludes to Plato. These texts, known as books of chivalry, are harmful to the Republic. Next, he signals that he fully understands the historical evolution of these novels, as well as the basic criticism of them as morally vapid. This genre of writing and composition derives from that known as Milesian fables, which are wild stories catering only to entertainment and not instruction, contrary to what the apologue fables do, which is to amuse and teach at the same time. He adds to this the aesthetic criticism of their utter implausibility and disorganization. It's impossible to believe that a knight defeats one million combatants with only the might of his valiant arm. And these texts are inconsistent, both in terms of their timeline and the geographic locations of their events. Above all, they lack organic harmony. 
I have not seen any book of chivalry that makes of its story a coherent body with all its arms and legs properly placed, such that the middle corresponds to the beginning and the end to the beginning and the middle, but rather they are composed with so many appendages that they seem designed to fashion a kind of chimera or a monster instead of forming a well-proportioned figure. The canon ends his negative review by saying that these books promote sex and violence by being lascivious in their love stories and long on battles, concluding that therefore they deserve to be banished from a Christian republic like useless people. Given the history of expulsions of Jews and Moors from Spain, this last comment is both ominous and ironic, especially because Don Quixote himself exemplifies the idle uselessness of so many Spanish hidalgos. So far, the canon has simply reiterated the key points of a common opinion. What comes next, however, is radically strange. After listening to the priest tell of the burning of Don Quixote's books, the canon changes his mind. He said that even though he had said much against those books, he still found one good thing about them, which was the possibility that they offered for a learned mind to display itself. This is amazing, and it's not a mild contradiction made in passing because now the canon elaborates a defense of the possibility of improving the chivalric genre, praising its capacity to represent good examples of heroes, magicians, and musicians and to speak about piety, courage, and even political matters of state. In addition, the genre allows the author to show himself to be epic, lyrical, tragic, comical, with all those aspects that contain within them the sweetest and most pleasant sciences of poetry and oratory. For epics can be written in prose as well as verse. Let's see, what book so varied in its content and form has the canon just described, if not the very one that we are reading?